to is Michael Kerisk. Uh, he's a Linux kernel programmer. He has written some books, like um, the one, one book, just a big book. Just one? Just one. Wasn't there two? It feels as big as two. Okay, so one very big book about uh, the Linux programming interface. Uh, yesterday he was uh, giving us a talk about uh, S-Trace, which I missed because I was here. Uh, has a nice daughter, I'm told by him. Small one. <laughs> Uh, and today he's going to talk about using uh, seccomp to limit attack surfaces. Welcome him. Thanks. Just out of curiosity, who, who knows C? C programming. Okay. Alrighty, well, I'm going to bring this, there's going to be some code in C, I hope you follow it. <laughs> um, even if you're not a C programmer. Okay, um, what I want to talk about is seccomp. Seccomp is a method by which a process can limit the system calls that it's allowed to make. And the whole idea is the Linux kernel provides about 400 different system calls. Most programs don't use most of those system calls. But the point is that if a program can be compromised, then every one of those system calls potentially is a way of attacking the program if the program can be compromised in such a way that it is tricked into ex trying to execute one of those system calls. And so the idea then with seccomp is instead of allowing all 400 or so possible system calls to be made, the program says, well, I already know in advance I'm going to make only these system calls and it tells the kernel that. And then after that, if the program tries to execute some other system call, then the kernel will detect that fact and kill the program. The notion being that, of course, if the program tried to ex execute an unexpected system call, then it perhaps is an indication that the program has been compromised by some sort of attack. So the program should just be killed. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about a few things. A little bit of history to begin with. SecComp has actually been around in some form or another for a long time, um, but it's only in the last few years that it's got really interesting. But there's a long history that precedes SecComp. So I'll talk a little bit about that history, um, and then more concretely about how you set up these SecComp filters that can be used to limit the system calls that a process is allowed to make. Whoops, I think we can skip the introduction to me. Um, so then an introduction to seccomp. I think I've already said all of this. It's a method to limit the system calls that a process is allowed to make. The very first version appeared around about 10 years ago now in the Linux kernel. Um, it was very simple back then. What you did to enable seccomp, you, um, uh, you wrote a value into one of the slash proc files, and after you did that, your program was in so-called strict seccomp mode. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. You also need to have a suitably configured kernel. There's a kernel configuration option that turns seccomp on and off. When you were in this strict seccomp mode, your process was limited to making just four system calls. Read and write for doing input and output, exit to terminate the process, and sig return. Now, sig return, even if you're a C programmer, is probably a system call you've never seen. But it's the system call that the kernel uses underneath the covers to allow signal handlers to be implemented. So in other words, you could do read and write, terminate, and handle signals. If you tried to do any other system call, then you got a sig kill signal, and your process was killed. The original idea that was behind this um, was originally implemented by a guy called Andrea Archangeli, who was and is a fairly well-known kernel developer. The idea he had was you could create a kind of market in CPU cycles where you could say to someone else on the internet, yeah, you can give me your program and I will run it in sec comp mode 
confident in the notion that it can't do damage on my system because the only thing it can do is read and write from files that have already been opened, terminate, and handle signals. In other words, it can't do all the other damaging things that a malicious program might attempt to do on the system because there's so little that it can do. Really, all it can do is do user space calculations. So his idea was, you know, you could then sell your CPU cycles on the internet to someone else who wanted to run some sort of CPU intensive code. This idea never really took off, but SecComp stayed in the kernel. Not a lot of interest for a, a while, but then over time, people started to modify the interface in interesting ways. Okay, so one way that things got changed, and this is one of the less interesting pieces, but in kernel 2.6.23, the, the interface for enabling sec comp changed. Instead of writing one to this special file proc pid sec comp, there was now a system called it did it PRCTL. This PRCTL operation provided or this PRCTL system call provided two options for working with sec comp. PR set sec comp enabled you to turn on secure computing mode, set comp mode. And the only thing you could put here was set your mode to sec comp mode strict, which is the same mode we already had. Then there was an option to say PR get sec comp. The idea here is to discover am I as a process in sec comp mode? And there's two possibilities. If you're not in sec comp mode, you got zero as a return value. And if you were in set comp mode, you got killed. Okay? Because PRCTL isn't one of the allowed system calls. Kernel developers do have a sense of humor. Okay? Um, things started to get really interesting, though. About three years ago, Linux 3.5 added something called so called filter set comp mode. And the notion here is. Well, whereas before with strict set comp mode, there were precisely four system calls you were allowed to make, with filter set comp mode, you can actually choose which system calls are going to be allowed. So you can say, my program will do all of those four traditional system calls, but perhaps half a dozen other system calls as well. But if the program tries to do anything else, it's going to get killed. The way you set up this filter set comp mode, you did a PRCTL, set set comp, set comp mode filter, and then the extra argument which I haven't shown here was a pointer to the filter that was going to be applied or would be applied to your process. So now you can choose exactly which system calls are going to be allowed to be executed by your process. Again, you need a suitably configured kernel as a new kernel option appeared at this time. This idea has really taken hold and um, I'm gonna, I haven't actually talked about what the idea is yet, but I just want to point out that already it's within three years becoming very widely used. So web browsers are using it for sandboxing, Chrome, the Chrome browser is using it, Firefox is using it, um, there's an FTP daemon that's using it, um, OpenSSH uses it, the container systems like Docker and LXC are also using it. LXC already has it, Docker, has the code built into the system, but they haven't yet decided on the user interface to be presented to systems administrators. So it's not actually shipping as such yet. But it, the plan is that it will very soon. Okay, Linux 3.8, some more changes, some more minor changes. A new way of finding out, am I in sec comp mode or not at the moment? Now you can find that information out by reading a certain file, proc pid sec comp, oh, sorry, proc pid status, and there's a field in there, sec comp, which displays a number zero, one, or two, indicating you are in sec, aren't in sec comp mode, or you're in strict mode, or you're in filter mode. The notion here is that if you've already got a file descriptor that refers to that file, you don't need to worry about reading from it and possibly being killed. Okay. Some more sort of reasonably minor changes. Linux 3.17, which of course is um, quite recent, um, just last year, there was a new system call added for 
putting yourself into sec comp mode. The reason the system call was added was there was a discussion about further extending sec comp mode by um, adding some new options to the PRCTL system call. And the question was, shall we further multiplex PRCTL? Now, PRCTL, which probably I guess even most C programmers are not familiar with, is a multiplexed system call in the style of IOCTL. So do we want to multiplex a multiplexing system call? Uh, and the decision was made, no, let's not do that. Let's invent a new system call which has the extended functionality. So what you get with SecComp is everything you got with PRCTL for SecComp plus a bit more. Um, I don't want to go into the details too much, but one of the new operations you could do was say, if I've got a multi-threaded process, synchronize all of the threads in the process to use the same filter. That was the key change. Okay, so set comp filtering. Available since kernel 3.5. Um, the idea is that you can apply a filter to your program saying what kind of system calls is it allowed to make. Those filters can examine the system call number and the system call arguments. What I mean by this is the filter can find out what system call is being executed and what are the register values that are supplied for that system call. So um, system calls might take pointer arguments, for example. Those pointers come in as registers. You can look at the registers, but you can't dereference the pointers to see what the system call, what the arguments point to. You can only look at the arguments themselves. The way these filters are expressed is in a notation called Berkeley packet filter syntax. What we'll see is this is a bit like a pseudo assembler um, because this is in effect what you're doing when you write a filter program. You're writing a little program in a kind of mini assembler and that program is interpreted by the kernel. Um, once you've defined what your filter looks like, you install it into the kernel using either the PRCTL system call or the newer SecComp system call. Once you've done that, every time your process makes a system call, this filter gets checked. So the kernel says, for every system call, I'll run this little program, this little filter program, and if the filter program says the system call's allowed, then I'll allow the process to make it. And if the filter says, no, the system call's not allowed, then It'll either kill the process, or there are other options as well, things like saying, yes, allow the process to proceed, but make this system call fail. Once you've installed a filter, you can't remove it. And the whole notion of SecComp is, we're about to execute some code we don't trust. We're going to call some library function, or maybe run some plugin code, or execute another program, and we don't fully trust what it's going to do. So the last thing we want to happen is for that untrusted code to be able to remove its restrictions. So once you've added a set comp filter, it's there forever for the life of the process. So this language that you write your filters in, this BPF language, actually has a much longer history than SecComp itself. Um, BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. So who does anything to do with network administration? Yeah. You, might even be, you should probably be familiar with this term BPF. The reason that BPF exists is for TCP dump. Now TCP dump is a program, for those of you who are not familiar with it, which enables you to monitor all the traffic that's going on in a network. In other words, to dump all of the packets that are being sent across a network to see what's happening on your network. Now, on a busy network, there might be hundreds of thousands of packets a second. And usually when you're using TCP dump, you're interested perhaps just in the communication between two applications. Perhaps, in other words, a very small percentage of the um, packets that are flying across the network. So then what you want TCP dump to do for you is to filter the packets that it shows to you. Don't show me hundreds of thousands of packets a second. Show me the 
perhaps 20 packets a second that are the interesting packets for the applications that I'm trying to monitor. So there's this filtering task that needs to go on. One way that filtering task could have been done is that all of the packets could have been sent by the kernel to TCP dump, and TCP dump could have done the filtering itself, okay, and looking at each of these 100,000 packets per second, let's say. Technically, this would have been possible. TCP dump could have done that filtering on all of those packets. The real problem, though, is all of those packets being transferred across the kernel to user space boundary is, would have been very expensive. We'd transfer 100,000 packets a second across the kernel user space boundary, and then most of them would get thrown away. But for all of those 100,000 packets, we would have paid the, con the cost of transfer across the kernel user space boundary. And it is a big cost. So the idea with BPF was you could set up a BPF filter for TCP dump, install that into the kernel, and that filter would look at each packet that was being sent across the network, and it would decide which packets would be transferred across the kernel user space boundary. So the key point there is, instead of transferring 100,000 packets a second across the network, you might just, oh, sorry, across the kernel user space boundary, you might just transfer 20. So it makes the work or the, the impact of TCP dump on the CPU much lower. The, the achievement of, I think I've said everything that's here on this slide now, the, the, the achievement of the SecComp developers, or the so-called SecComp2 developers, SecComp2 is the notion or the name that's often given to SecComp filtering mode, the, the achievement of the SecComp2 developers was to realize this notion of an in-kernel virtual machine could be made general. We don't need to just look at network packets, we could look at the information that comes with system calls, for example. And then we could use this same Berkeley packet filter to do this kind of task of filtering system calls, as was done with network packets. Okay, so the whole idea of BPF, it defines a kind of virtual machine. Um, in other words, a little mini architecture with its own assembler type instructions. Uh, and its own, if you like, mini memory architecture, and we can write programs for this architecture. This architecture has some, some characteristics. First of all, it's got a very simple instruction set. There's quite a small number of instructions. They're all the same size. Because it's a simple set of instructions, they're all the same size, it's a limited set, it's very simple to implement. This, uh, this instruction set. Oh, another thing. There are jump instructions in this uh, architecture, but you can only jump forward in a program. In other words, you know that a program is going to complete because you can only go forward. There's no possibility of loops. And the critical point here, of course, is what you're doing is you're loading code into the kernel and getting the kernel to execute it. You want to be absolutely sure that the code is getting, that's getting put inside the kernel can't itself be used to attack the system. So you want to have guarantees about the integrity of that code. And one of the guarantees you want is you know the code is going to complete. So the kernel does a lot of work to make sure that BPF programs are safe and as I say, BPF itself as a concept has been around for 25 years, or nearly 25 years. So there's been a lot of work in ironing out all the bugs. Um, uh, so it is safe. So the kernel can do various things like ensuring a program completes, checking that all the instructions in the program are valid, um, looking for things like dead code, in other words, a jump over some instructions where there is no jump into those instructions so that that code could never be executed, and making sure that every program, every termination path of the program completes with a so-called return instruction. And the purpose of the return instruction is to tell the kernel, well, with this system call, you can allow it to succeed, you can allow it to proceed, 
you shouldn't allow it to proceed, you should kill the process, or perhaps you should allow the process to proceed but cause this system call to fail. You've got a few choices. Um, BPF programs are limited in size to 4K instructions, which should be enough for most people. Okay, I think I've said most of this. Um, I'll just mention in passing, this, this whole notion of an in-kernel virtual machine has, in the last year or two, generated a lot of interest among kernel developers. So the BPF is nowadays not just being used for network packet filtering and for system call filtering, it's being used for doing things like filtering um, perf, uh, monitoring probes, for um, filtering K probes. Um, there's currently work on using SecComp for the check, checkpoint restore code that's going into the kernel or to add check, um, BPF filtering to checkpoint restore code in the kernel. There's a bunch of other things as well. And we're likely to see a lot more uses of BPF in various aspects of the kernel in the future. So we want to write BPF programs. We need to know a little bit more about the virtual machine. The virtual machine, as well as a set of instructions, it has an accumulator register. This is the place where you have to put some piece of information in order to do perhaps arithmetic or logic tests. There's a data area. This is, if you like, the memory that the program has to work with. The data area for a set comp when you're talking about system calls is very limited. It essentially consists of the system call number, in other words, the unique identifier for a system call, the arguments for the system call, and one or two other bits and pieces as well. This is a mini architecture. Naturally, there's a, a program counter that steps through your programs. Okay? You can step forward single instructions. If you've got a jump, you might jump over several instructions. The instructions, if you express them in C, as a C structure, look like this. What you've got here is a 64-bit structure where the first 16 bits are the opcode of the instruction. The last 32 bits are an operand for the instruction. If we're talking about adding uh, a number to the accumulator, that, that would be the number we're adding. And then every instruction, well, I'll rephrase that, instructions potentially have two other pieces, a jump true and a jump false offset. The idea here is that you can have test instructions where you say, perhaps, is the accumulator, excuse me, is the accumulator equal to a certain value? If it is, jump to this location, otherwise jump to a different location. Okay? But every instruction looks this way. It's 64 bits long, and potentially these four fields are all used, or perhaps only some subset of the fields. The kinds of instructions you've got then, um, the kinds of things that you might expect out of an assembler type um, instruction set, you've got load, store, arithmetic instructions, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo. Um, You've got logic instructions like OR, AND, left shift, right shift. And then there are these return instructions which, te which tell the program to complete, informing the kernel what should it do with this system call. OK, um, there's conditional and unconditional jump instructions. The conditional jump instructions, um, whoops, excuse me, they have an opcode, they have a value that's going to be used for a test, and then they have, as I mentioned, a jump true and a jump false target. There's the jump instructions you have, jump if equal, in other words, test does the accumulator equal a certain value, uh, jump greater than, is the accumulator greater than a certain value, jump greater than or equal, is it greater than or equal, and so on and so on. And you might say, because you can see four instructions there if you've done any assembler program, well, where are the instructions, for instance, do not equal or less than? We don't need them because the four tests that we have there also have a false label and they provide the complement. So the opposite of jump equal is the false branch, which gives us a jump not equal, and so on. Um, when we do these jumps, the jumps, jump targets are expressed as relative offsets. 
because the jump true and jump false are just eight bits, we can only jump up to 255 instructions. There is a jump unconditional which allows us to jump further if we need to. The instructions, the BPF filter instructions, get this data area that describes the system call that's currently being inspected. And then the information that the SEC comp program gets is if we expressed it in C code, the structure of the data looks like this. There's um, essentially um, four fields here. The first field tells us what is the system call number. So every system call has a unique number. And this field here tells us what the unique number for that system call is. The arc, arch field here tells us what machine language architecture are we running on. Are we on x86, are we on ARM, or whatever. The point here is you could write a sec comp filter on, or build it on one architecture, store it in a file, and then run it in a program that is on a completely different architecture. So the SecCom filter needs to know which architecture is it actually running on. Okay, and we'll see why in a moment. One of the other things you get is the instruction pointer. Where is the process inside the virtual address space at the moment? Which actual instruction in the real program is currently being executed? And then the last field here is an array of six 64-bit um, um, integers. These are the arguments to the system call. System calls on Linux can have up to six arguments. Those arguments are supplied to the BPF program um, in these six array fields here. OK, I think I've covered all of that. Um, I just mentioned that for the architecture, there are some constants defined in a certain Linux header file. And they give you symbolic names like this, uh, audit arch x8664, arch i386, arch arm, and so on. Um, I've talked about this instruction pointer and the arguments. Since BPF is a kind of assembler, you could, in theory, code your BPF instructions numerically, by hand, you know, just like back in the 1950s before we even had assemblers. To save you at least some work, what the, um, there, are, there are some C header files that provide you with some standard macros, which allow you in your C program to define um, instructions using these macros. So two macros that we have here, BPF statement, BPF jump. These are for defining normal BPF statements or BPF jump instructions. Really, all that these two macros are doing are taking um, some arguments here and building them into that 64-bit structure that I mentioned before, where we've got an opcode, perhaps a jump true and a jump false, and a, an argument that we're working on. Same thing here for um, BPF jump, uh, but in this case, the jump true and jump false are used. And again, they're plugged together to make this 64-bit structure with up to four fields. So this is all kind of abstract so far, but here's an example of how we might write a BPF instruction inside our C program. So here we've said we're constructing a BPF statement. This piece here is an opcode that says load something into the accumulator. This, part, this piece here says we're loading a word into the accumulator as opposed to, let's say, a byte. And the abs piece here says where is the word coming from? And that notation means load it from the data area. In other words, going back to this structure here, we're loading something out of this data area. The thing that we're loading is the architecture. Now, even I find that even C programmers are not often familiar with this macro here called offset of. It's for giving you the offset of a certain field within a structure. But if you're not familiar with C even, you can understand this to mean that inside the set comp data, I want the architecture field here. So in other words, we're loading this field, and the place that it gets loaded into 
is the accumulator, the accumulator register. And once it's in that register, we can start doing operations on that value. Another example of BPF instruction, here we're saying this is a jump instruction. Um, we use the BPF jump macro. We're doing a jump, testing if the accumulator is equal to a value, and the value we're testing for equality is the value given in the opcode, the K component of the um, structure that I, I looked at earlier on that defines the structure of BPF instructions. So, and the, the um, argument value is this constant here. In other words, um, architecture x8664. What I'm doing with this instruction is saying, is the value in the accumulator equal to the constant for the architecture x8664? This is the way that the BPF program has of asking, am I running on an x8664 system at the moment, or am I on some other architecture? BPF programs need to ask this question because, well, I'll, I'll back up a second. One of the things that's going to happen next is we're going to test, well, is the program trying to execute a certain system call? And system calls are defined by system call numbers. And the question is, the, the, before we do that test, we need to know which architecture you're on because on different architectures, system calls have different numbers. So that, for instance, on the x86-64 architecture, the open system call might have a certain system call number, but on ARM, it's got a completely different number. So before we try and do any of these tests, we need to check, are we running on a particular architecture? Because otherwise, all of our tests about system call numbers later on are meaningless. So the very first thing we do is check, is my assumption that I'm running on an x86-64 system true? And then the next two pieces here are the jump true and jump false targets. The jump true target says, if the accumulator is equal to this value, jump forward one instruction. Otherwise, jump forward zero instructions. In other words, do the next instruction. Another example of BPF instruction um, BPF statement uh, here where we're doing a return statement. The return is an instruction to the kernel or an instruction that says complete processing of this BPF program and tell the kernel something about this system call. And in this case, what we're saying is tell the kernel to kill the process. Okay? We don't like what this process is trying to do. It's trying to execute a system call that it shouldn't, for example. And so we're going to kill the process. I mentioned already BPF programs. The first thing they should do is check the architecture on, they're on because if we're going to do tests on system call numbers, we want to make sure that our system call numbers are valid. So I, I've covered pretty much what's on this slide already. Um, the next point is, once we've created the filter and installed it into the kernel, now every system call that we make is going to be tested against that filter to see if the system call is one that should be permitted. Um, and each set comp filter is going to return a value indicating whether, that, uh, whether a, a system call is permitted or not. This return value that comes back to the kernel is in two pieces. It's a 32-bit return value. 16 bits tell the kernel what the kernel should do to the process, and the other 16 bits are some accompanying information um, to do with, with whatever action the kernel should do. And we've got five possible actions that we can tell the kernel to do when we've checked the system call. One is we can say to the kernel, everything's good. Allow this system call. Another possibility is we don't want to allow this system call. Um, and we're telling the kernel to kill the process outright. A third possibility is we can tell the kernel, let the process proceed, but cause this system call to fail. And then the process might take some suitable response to the failure of the system call. But the process continues to live and can do something more. Um, there's a couple more options that I don't really want to go into too much. Um, you can also say pass control to a tracing process. 
Um, I'll, I'll leave that for now. This is if you've got a debugger involved and so on, but I won't worry about that too much. Um, there's another possibility as well. Again, I won't worry about too much uh, where you can cause a, pro a signal to be sent to the process. Okay, so let's look at some BPF programs in a bit more detail. When you define a BPF program, or once you've defined a BPF program, you can install it into your process. You say either set comp or PRCTL, and you specify um, the corresponding instruction here with set comp. We're saying install a filter. There's some flags that might be used to modify the behavior of the call. And then the last argument is a pointer to the filter program. We can do the same thing with slightly different syntax with um, PRCTL. This last argument here in both of these system calls is a pointer to a structure that looks like this. And this structure just has two pieces. One of the pieces is a pointer to the filter program itself, and the other is an integer that tells us how big the filter program is. Okay, so our filter program might consist of, say, 10 BPF instructions. So this value here would be 10, and this argument here would be a pointer to those 10 instructions. Hmm. I think I'm going to skip over this piece. I'm just going to say if you're in an unprivileged program, one of the things you do before you install, I've got 10 minutes, that's why I'm going to skip over this piece. <laughs> one of the things you've got to do before you install a, a BPF program is to execute a special PRCTL system call um, and this is to do with preventing compromises of set UID and set GID programs. I won't try and go into that now. I'll just say, we'll take it as given that you have to do this. Okay, so let's actually look at an example. Here's a C program where I start off by enabling that no new privs option that I just skipped over now. I'll just say, as I said, that we, we should assume that needs to be done. Then I've got a piece of code that installs my BPF filter. I'll look at that code in a moment. The point is I've installed a filter, and now I'm going to try and do something in my program. What I'm going to try and do is open a file for reading. And then I'm going to print out a message saying, we shouldn't see this message, which is going to give you, give you a clue about what's supposed to happen here. And then the program terminates. Now, this install filter function looks like this. It's going to define a BPF filter and then install it for this process. And here's what my filter looks like. It's a struct SOC filter. Um, I, I sort of glossed over the names before, but BPF instructions are um, these structures of type SOC filter, which tells us about where BPF originally came from. It was used for network packet filtering, sockets, SOC filter. So struct SOC filter, it's an array of instructions here. The first instruction says, load a value into the accumulator. It's a word from the data area, and the word we want to load is the architecture. So load the architecture into the accumulator. And then we do a jump instruction when we say, if the value in the accumulator is equal to arch x8664, in other words, if I'm on the x8664 architecture, then I'm going to jump forward one instruction. So I'll skip over the next BPF instruction. Otherwise, I'm going to jump forward zero instructions. So I'll do the next BPF instruction. And the next BPF instruction says, return control to the kernel, telling the kernel to kill this process. What I've just said here is, if I'm not on the x86-64 architecture, kill the process. Assuming I am on the x86-64 architecture, the next thing I do is load a word from the data area into the accumulator. The word I'm loading is the system call number. And then I'm going to do another test where I say, do a jump if the value in the accumulator is equal to a constant. The constant there, underscore, underscore, n are open, is the system call number for the open system call. In other words, is the system call that's currently being made an open system call? If it is, I'm going to jump forward one instruction. Otherwise, I'm going to jump forward zero instructions. If I jump forward one instruction, I'm going to land here. But if I jump forward zero instructions, I'm going to land here. And this instruction here says return control to the kernel, telling the kernel 
this system call should be allowed. In other words, anything except open is allowed. But if I've got an open system call, I'm going to return control to the kernel telling it to kill the process. In other words, if this process tries to make an open system call, it's going to get killed. Any other system calls allowed, though? And here's the piece where I actually install the filter, where I set up a structure that points to my um, filter program. I say how long the filter program is here. The, the filter program is the size of the filter divided by the size of the first instruction. This is just a way of generating the size of the program. Here's the pointer to my filter here. And I call set comp, and I say I'm installing a set comp filter, and here's a pointer to my filter program. So when I run this program now, this C program of mine, what happens is the program's called set comp deny open. When I run the program at the shell, I see a message bad system call. This is because the shell has detected that this program is being killed by a SIGSYS signal, which is the way that um, the kernel kills a program when it disallows a system call. And the kernel sees that this was a SIGSYS signal and says, oh, that's the signal that corresponds to bad system call. I have four minutes. Hmm. I'm going to skip over a more complex example and just jump forward to talk about um, a few other details. Um, I'm going to skip over that, uh, that as well. Oh, yeah. Just a few other things to mention that um, are, are perhaps of interest. When you install a BPF filter, every system call that you make from now on is going to be checked. Is this system call allowed by the filter? In other words, there's a performance cost. So just by way of example, that deny open BPF program that I showed you before had six instructions. If I write a program that simply calls the get PPID system call, which returns a process's parent ID, um, if I just do that as rapidly as I possibly can and get PPID as a very simple system call, then I add about 25% to the execution time of my program, which sounds like a lot, but get PPID is a very simple system call. And usually programs wouldn't spend all the time making only system calls. So there is a cost, but it's relatively small um, depending on how often and how, how frequently, sorry, how often and how many system calls your process makes. You can improve the performance of your BPF, of your BPF builders by coding the instructions in a suitable way. Obviously, a BPF program might have many tests in it. If you code the important tests first so that your BPF program finishes quickly, the cost of the BPF filter is less. Um, if you actually sit down and try and write one of these BPF filters, you'll get tired of it very quickly. So I'll just mention that there are some tools that make your life much easier. Um, oh, and I'll just mention as well, the uses there's a couple of uses that I see. One is sandboxing, which is what most of the applications that I talked about at the beginning are using. They're using set comp to do sandboxing to, to limit what a program can do. But there's another um, interesting possibility as well, is, which I've seen less of, is failure mode testing, where you set up a set comp filter that makes a program fail in an unexpected way because you want to see what does a program do in that circumstance? You know, perhaps that kind of failure is very rare in practice, but you actually want to bring it about to see that when such a failure occurs, your program fails well instead of failing badly. Um, there are some high-level APIs for um, creating set comp programs. There's one called libsec comp. Libsec comp, what this allows you to do is to, it's essentially it's an API we can, with various function calls, say, I want to construct a set comp filter that tests this system call and perhaps disallows that system call and perhaps allows this system call just as long as it has certain arguments. And you make a range of API calls. And then there's an API that you can use at the end, which is a kind of push button where you can say, give me the BPF program. 
So this saves you the work of having to code the BPF program yourself by hand. Um, there's actually, unusually for a library, very full documentation with examples in the man pages. There is also an article at LWN that talks about libsetcomp. There is a BPF compiler. What this will let you do is write a program in a kind of symbolic assembler language and then run it through the compiler and get the BPF code out at the end. In relatively recent times, LLVM, the compiler, has now a backend for, sec, um, for BPF. And you can write, uh, sorry, it's a backend for extended BPF. Um, it'll take a C type language and produce BP, eBPF instructions. Now, eBPF, extended BPF, is being used in other parts of the kernel at the moment, but eBPF e support is planned to be added for sec comp very soon now as well. Um, I won't go into it, I think, but there is a JIT compiler in the kernel which will enable BPF programs to be compiled to native machine code so your BPF programs run faster, so they have less impact on your code in terms of performance. Um, uh, there's some man pages there where you can look up for further information. There are various other places where you can get further information as well, uh, various references there, and I'm going to say that I just finished on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and maybe there's a couple of minutes for questions. No? Sorry. You can grab me for questions if you want. If you have any questions for Michael, find him outside uh, or tonight. Talk to him. He's a good guy.